Welcome, everybody. Why don't you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, verses 14 to 18. That's on page 1646, if you want to follow it in your pew Bibles. John writes, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John, that's John the Baptist, testified concerning him. He cried out, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace. Ah, we missed a bit. The next verse reads, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may we understand more of your revelation of law through Moses and grace and truth through our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Touch our minds and our hearts that we might serve you in a fresh and better way this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of weeks ago, I had an incident in my business where uh, I got a phone call from one of my line managers and I was told about a particular incident that happened of an employee and this employee had done something which was seriously wrong. And I've kind of learned over the years not to react immediately. So I said, no, thank you. And I put down and I well, didn't put down the phone, the phone was switched off. And the first thought that came to my head was, Mercy triumphs judgment, which is a, a scripture. And so I thought about it, and my reaction 20 years ago to those sort of incidents in business was, you're out the door. But as I think I've grown in Jesus, I've tried to listen to the checks of the Spirit in my life so I don't go off track and now, a few weeks later, I think listening to that check that mercy triumphs judgment, having understood the whole situation behind what happened, that was a wise choice. So this morning, I want to explore that incredible verse from John's prologue to his gospel. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. When John writes his wonderful introduction to the book of John, he first of all says, the Word was with God and the Word was God. And that was basically a statement of how God created the world through the agency of his Son, part of the Trinity, in speaking out the Word, the Logos, which created the world. Then John moves on and talks about John the Baptist. So there's incarnation, then John the Baptist, which says, this word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it becomes not just theory, not just theology, but flesh and blood revelation as the Lord of the universe took on human flesh and walked this earth and lived our life. Then in verse 17, John sums up two or three really incredible themes in God's revelation. Now, revelation just means unveiling, like taking the, um, the, the wrapper off a beautiful present. Grace and truth came through Jesus, which is the era we live in, but the law was given through Moses. And they are three key concepts we need to understand. 
So this morning I want to unpack like some big picture stuff about law, grace and truth. Then I want to bring it down to those checks that we have in our lives and some tips about how to walk in grace and truth and what to do with the stuff that goes on within us as the Holy Spirit writes God's law on our heart that checks us so that we become more and more like Jesus as we go on and on. So, let's begin. If you grab your Bible, just find where the New Testament begins, if you've got one there. Just, just a nice physical thing to do. It's after the book of Malachi, if that's a hint for you. Now, the first section, while some of you are doing that, the first section of the Scriptures we call the Old Testament. Sometimes people call it the Hebrew Bible. It's about how God worked and showed His character and His plan to fix up the world until the birth of Jesus. Now, sometimes in the New Testament, even in the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament is referred to as law or Torah. But the key of God's revelation of Himself in the Old Testament, or one of the keys, is in the giving of the law. And that primarily happens in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through to Deuteronomy. Now, they're tough going to read for someone possibly 3,000 years later than when they were written but they are wonderful to read, the revelation of God's law. Now, sometimes people get a false understanding that the Old Testament is like, oh, God's problem, and then he fixes it up in the new. That's a false understanding because the God of law, you do see that strongly in the Old Testament, but you read the Old Testament and you see God is a God of grace and mercy and wonder and forgiveness. Even a quick understanding of the Old Testament, you see that. You see how God worked in the life of David. I mean, David was one of God's mates, but David really wrecked his life up, seriously wrecked his life up. Adultery, murder, just a, the first of his two major sins, but lots of problems. Yet God showed mercy and grace to him. Read the Psalms and you see that. So it's a false opposition to say that God fixed up things when he sent Jesus. No, no, no. God had a plan and he revealed himself over time to us. Now, I'm going to read you the Ten Commandments, which are the essence of the law. In some traditions of the church, uh, these were read every Sunday. Um, but that's sort of fallen out of favour. But I'm going to read it to you. If you want to follow them, uh, go to Exodus 20, um, which is page 118. When you read these, you'll see that this, this is actually the basis for most law or like legal type law in Christian countries or Christian heritage countries. In a world where Christianity is countercultural, some of you might be shocked when you hear these because they are very absolute statements. But truth is ultimately absolute. And that's part of the challenge of Christians living in a culture that is said that truth is relative. But we'll talk more about that later. So, Moses receives these words from God. God spoke these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth below or on the waters below, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children 
for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. There's that little twist there we'll talk more about later between judgment and grace. The effect of our evil actions are consequential. They do last through our families. And if you've lived a while, you'll know that. But God's love towards us is to the thousandth generation. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord your God will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath or a day of rest to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When you read them together, I know when I read them even now, I go, ah, there's weight in those words and there's a conviction in our hearts when we read those words. It's like a very foreign set of words. But the purpose of that law ultimately is to lead us to Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we know that those words are beyond us, it leads us to a poverty of spirit which leads us to God's grace and truth in Jesus. So what's grace? I have a friend who is in the ministry and he used to illustrate grace in the children's talk by putting a $20 bill on a chair at the front of the church and saying to the children, who wants $20? You can just come out and grab it. And most of the time, how many people came out to get it? Nobody. Because <laughs> they felt, oh, I didn't deserve it, or there's a trick, or something bad's going to happen. But grace is God's gift to us that we didn't earn, that is unmerited. It's his favour that comes to us when we reach out and ask. That's grace. I think grace is one of the most beautiful words. What's truth? A philosopher would spend ages and ages and volumes and volumes trying to define truth. But John says the truth is in the incarnation Jesus. In his gospel, he says, well, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the embodiment of God's truth. I like to define truth in terms of Jesus in terms of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son or one and only Son, that who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's truth. So truth, in terms of the Christian gospel, is the good news that Jesus came and died for our sins. On the cross, he took the penalty for our sins, for our transgressions, and set us free that we might live for him. 
So how do we put together law, grace, truth? There are a few images that I'd just like to share with you. The first, and I think really important image in my life, is the image that Paul uses in Galatians 3.24. The law was our guardian, Paul writes, until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Some people say, some other translations say, the law was our tutor until Christ came. So like the law, the fact that when we read the Ten Commandments, it makes us, ah, is actually our tutor to restrain us or restrain sin or point us to the way to come in Jesus. So for someone like David, he clearly transgressed the Ten Commandments. Right? Adultery with Bathsheba, yep. Murder with her husband. And in the Old Testament sacrificial system, there was no sacrifice for sins that you deliberately committed. The sacrificial system in the Old Testament was about sins you did unintentionally. So, like, David cried out to God for mercy. So, the law was his tutor or his guardian to point to the mercy that was to come in Jesus Christ. Saints in the Old Testament, I think, had an intuitive understanding that, yeah, there is mercy and grace in God, but the fullness of that revelation of grace and truth, that only came when Jesus. Then it's like, ah, I see it. And that's why John says, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the first image is tutor or guardian. The second and most important image to me is the notion that comes out of Ezekiel that when the Holy Spirit comes, he works to write God's law on our hearts. Let me read this scripture to you. It's from Ezekiel 36, and it's a really important scripture to grab if you can. Ezekiel writes, he's talking about what God was going to do in the last days, and that's the days we live in. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. That last verse is really important. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my heart, my decrees and to be careful to follow your law, his laws. So in that incident I described at the beginning, old Ian would be vengeful, legalistic, and would... <laughs> but the Holy Spirit in my heart prompted me to a scripture to say, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> and I know for me in many times in my life, it's when God's Spirit has convicted me of doing something that was against His law that I came back to the truth and grace that is found in Jesus. I corrected my course and moved on. So just when we think about, in a big picture sense, those verses, the law was given through Moses. Think of God showing us the way to live. Think of God showing us his standards, not our standards. And then when we realize our inadequacies, we can run to him in Jesus, the source of grace, 
unmerited love and forgiveness and truth, which we know is embodied in the good news of the gospel, that Jesus came to die for us. So that's some big picture stuff. And I want to just talk about how we live this out. How does it operate in our lives? As Pastor Sandy alluded to earlier on, when you become a Christian, God starts to work within you to make you more and more like Jesus. Sometimes that easy, that's easy. You can get rid of stuff out of your life that you're not really held by. But other times it can be a difficult process because there's stuff in all of our lives that is, to be honest, deeply offensive to God and he needs to chip away at you to get that out of your life. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to keep pointing us back to Jesus, to enable us to, like, I suppose, appropriate all the blessings of the cross in our life and allow our lives to become like a city on a hill, a light to others, so that when they see us, they think, oh, not Ian's a great guy, but Jesus is great in Ian. Very important. So let me just share five things about that. Firstly, we need to allow what I would call, in the current management jargon, virtuous circle in our life. We need to get ourselves into a position where we allow the law of God to speak to our hearts so that we, through his grace and the truth that is in Jesus, change. So then the circle comes back until God then begins to work on the next issue in our character that needs work. So we go, God convicts us of something, we take action through Jesus through his spirit, to change it. So we have this virtuous circle going on in our lives that we get more and more Christ-like in what we do. So how do you, what are some ways that you allow that virtuous circle to happen? I think the first thing to say, and this is a, a concept you need to, to think about, we need to realise that our conscience is not always the law of God working in our hearts. Our conscience, because we're fallen human beings, can be not a great guide to what is right. Because our conscience has been coloured by the world we live in and by our own character. So sometimes we can justify something by our conscience, but God is deeply offended by it. We need to ground ourselves in God's word and listen to the checks of his spirit way more than we listen to our inner voice or conscience and ask God to have an ability to discern that in your life. It will save you from many false paths. Everyone get what I'm saying? Your conscience, don't trust it. Trust the Word of God. Secondly, I think another important point, and again, this is a difficult concept, but one really worth getting to understand. If you're like me and you're an evangelical, I'm inclined to fall into this statement, so-and-so made a decision for Jesus. Right? And it's good that people make a decision for Jesus. But really, what Jesus is not calling us to is a decision, but a surrender. Jesus never says, make a decision to follow me. He simply says, follow me. Take up your cross. And what's the cross a symbol of? Death. And follow me. He says to the people he heals, follow me. And Luke writes, so he followed him down the road, the road of Jesus. So I can make a decision to support the Broncos this season, and if I'm not happy with them, I can support the Titans the next season. Can't do that with Jesus. It's a surrender. 
Okay. Another pretty practical point is when you are convicted by the Holy Spirit of a law-like breach in your life, ask for forgiveness. Keep short accounts with God. Don't allow yourself to rationalize. So you're walking down the road this way, which is following Jesus, and so all of a sudden you think, oh, it's not really such a bad thing. So I start walking off up this way, and what starts out as a deviation like this ends out with this massive deviation. So if God convicts you of, of something, if you feel checked about something in your life, fix it up straight away. Don't let it, don't dwell on it. Say, Lord, I'm sorry, I am going back to the path that you want. I think that's a really important thing. And again, I could share some stuff ups in my life that became because I didn't do that. Another really important thing is to seek times where you're still before God. Now, that might be early in the morning. It might be going for a walk. It might be late at night. I've even had people say to me, you know, sometimes I've just got to shut the door of the toilet and sit there <laughs> and because the kids are everywhere to get some quiet time with God. But that is a really important thing to do because God will speak to you through his law to bring you back to grace and truth so that circle can go on and you can become more and more like Jesus. Don't neglect your quiet time. If you haven't got a quiet time now, please start one. It's easy to have a quiet time. Don't watch that TV show. Just go to some section of your house where it's quiet. Grab a Bible and maybe just read through John's Gospel or some portion of Scripture, slowly each day and just say, hey, God, what's happening? Run off your petitions if you wish, but take time just to shut up <laughs> and listen to God. Really important. And God, who has written his law on your heart through, your Holy, through his Holy Spirit, will nudge, point, issues in your life, and you can change them by his power. My final point, and I think this is a, a critical one, especially for me, and I suspect for a lot of us here. Don't let law dominate grace and truth. Okay. My beautiful wife makes a lovely dish, chicken dish, um, which is crumb chicken and a sweet and sour sauce. All right. It's beautiful because it has three elements in balance. It's got crunch. I like crunch. And it's got sweetness, but it's also got a bit of a bite to it as well. And it's just beautiful to eat. And our Christian life needs to have balance in the sense that law doesn't dominate grace and truth. One of my favorite Christian writers in the 80s and 90s was John White. I remember John White preaching one day that I was at a conference, and I think Jill was, Jill's over in Sunday school, and it really convicted me because he said, evangelicals are at heart legalists, <laughs> and all of us need to be aware of that because in our preoccupation with the Word, we can sometimes allow self-condemnation and condemnation of others override the truth that God is a grace, God of grace and truth, as well as law. If you don't have law, there is disaster. Christianity doesn't say, come to Jesus and do what you like. That is not the gospel. Christianity says, I am much higher than yours. You are. You are fallen. Look at yourself. Don't look at others. Look at yourself and you see how much you need the grace and truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, 
in all those disciplines in your life, and I encourage you to have disciplines in your life, quiet time, Bible reading, let them be disciplines that are governed by grace and truth, especially towards others. Yes, don't let pride grow in your heart because you can keep the Ten Commandments better than anyone else. Don't let that be a thing to point at others. Let grace and truth resonate throughout your life. When you do that, your life and your witness to Jesus will be like the city on the hill, the light that shines brightly that says to people in a world that doesn't understand there is absolute truth, there are moral standards, that following Jesus is the way to liberation. It's the way to the abundant life that Jesus talks about. I hope uh, I've helped you this morning because uh, we're all travellers in that direction as we become as individuals and as the body of Christ more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you, Lord, that you gave us the law. It's such a mirror of your perfect ways. As your Holy Spirit works in us, he having written the laws, your laws on our hearts, may we be people who are transformed into the light and life of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our Redeemer. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might change to be more and more like you today, this week, and for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.